Well, good morning, church family. Hey, look around. Who says people don't go to church a Sunday after Easter? <laughs> hey, give your neighbor a big hand clap for being in church today. Well, it's so good to be here today. Let me just get uh, my notepad open. I want to welcome all of you and uh, add my welcome to Pastor Matt's. You look real good on the big screen, Pastor Matt. Uh, anyway, just want to say welcome to all of you. Thank you for being here. I want you to know that whenever, whenever we gather together to worship, God has a word for you. Is anybody ready for a word from the Lord today? Amen. And to everybody who's watching online, no matter where you are, in New Jersey or in America or around the world, we are so glad that you are with us today. And I believe that the Lord is going to speak something powerful to you as well. At the close of our service, we will be taking the Lord's Supper or Holy Communion. So for those of you who are watching online, we'd just like to let you know that if you want to gather some crackers or some juice as well. So you can take communion with us today. Well, how many of you felt the earthquake the other day? I haven't felt the earth move like that since I kissed Luann for the first time. Did I do good, brother? Now, husbands, if your wife is with you, if you're smart, I'm going to give you five seconds to lean over and tell her the same thing. You did it, didn't you, Larry? <laughs> Hey, it's so good to be with you today, and uh, we're starting a brand new message series this morning on an Old Testament book of the Bible, the book of Ruth, and we're really titling it, Finding God in the Ordinary. Now, this might surprise you. I don't know if you know this. Ruth has only four chapters, and there are a total of 85 verses. That's it in this book of Ruth. Everybody's heard this statement, I think. How many of you have heard the devil's in the details? Anybody ever heard that? I'm going to change that and reframe it today. God is in the details. Somebody say that out loud. God is in the details. Not just those big monumental moments in our life, but I'm telling you that God is in the, in the everyday details of our life, leading us, directing us, guiding us into his purposes. If you believe that, say amen out loud. Now, in the book of Ruth, we're jumping into this today, you're not going to see any jaw-dropping miracles, no parting of the Red Sea, no healing the sick, uh, no raising the dead, but on every page, you're going to see God at work in the everyday lives of ordinary people. The same is true for you. Some suggest that the book of Ruth may be the most beautiful love story ever written. We're going to see in the book of Ruth some heart-stopping moments, maybe even a little risque. We're going to look at tragedy and loss, just like all of you or the people that you know have experienced tragedy and loss and where God is in all of that. You're going to see some people make some bad decisions, but you're also going to see how God can turn our mess into a miracle. You're also going to see how God has mercy for our mistakes. Is anybody thankful for that? You know, I heard somebody say if Ruth was a, a movie, it would be a chick flick. So, <laughs> sorry for all you action movie types. There's no killing in this book. There's no fights. There's no battles. And just so you know how I know it's a chick flick, in the 85 verses, 55 of them are dialogue. All the wives loved me a minute ago. Now they're not sure. All kidding aside, this is an amazing, powerful story. And it touches our lives on so many levels. There's really no way for me to express, going through this book and preparing these messages, what you're going to experience from God today and over the next few weeks. I'm going to encourage you not to miss one message. In case you do, you can go to our YouTube channel or back to our website, and you can pick them up there as well. I believe God is going to speak to us through his word. Are you ready for the word, everybody? Amen. I'm calling part one this, when it's time to walk away. When it's time to walk away. Let's jump into it. Before we do, could we just stand together and pray? Come on, let, let's, let's stand together. I don't want this to be another service. I believe 
God has poured a word into me and I'm gonna release it here in a moment. Father, I thank you for your presence and your power. I thank you for your word that's alive and powerful and sharper than a double-edged sword. Now God, I pray that you will prepare our hearts. We will hear what the spirit of the living God wants to speak to our hearts today. And I pray not one of us will leave the same way we came, but we will be changed in Jesus' name. Everybody say amen. amen. Go ahead and be seated, everyone. I'm gonna take you to chapter one. We're gonna start with the very first verse. Here it is. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. Now you could just pass over that, but I wanna take you a little deeper. In the days when the judges ruled, it says there was a famine in the land. Now if you have a paper Bible with you, one of these, and you don't just turn it on, uh, how many know what book in the Bible comes before the book of Ruth? Anybody know? Judges, the book of Judges. Now. The very last verse in the book of Judges, don't miss this. The very last book in the verse of Judges says this. Judges 21, verse 25. In the days when the judges ruled, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. How many know that's a setup for disaster? In the days when the judges ruled, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Sound a little bit like today? Now here's a family that's afraid. Now walk with me. There's a famine in Judah, if you will, in Bethlehem. And there's a family that's scared for their life. There's not going to be anything to eat. And so they, they make a move. Verse number two. The man's name, the husband, was Elimelech. His wife's name was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah. And they went to Moab and lived there. Let's break down the characters in this plot. Elimelech. Everybody say Elimelech. That's just a fun name to say, isn't it? Elimelech, Elimelech. I didn't say Awimowet, Awimowet. I said Elimelech, Elimelech. His name means my God is king. Then there's his wife, Naomi. That means sweet or pleasant. Now they have two sons. And to understand Back in Bible times, how they named their sons or daughters, they would name them one of two ways. They would either name them with a prophetic edge, what they wanted to see in them, or they would name them after what they saw in them after they were born. And Malan means sick or sickly, and Kilion means frail or tired. I'd like you to meet my two sons, sick and tired. Some of you are thinking, I didn't know that was an option. You know, meet my two sons, lazy and knucklehead. But <laughs> so, so that's, what, that's what their names meant. And uh, Elimelech is worried about his family because of the famine. So he moves his family from Bethlehem to Moab. That's about a 50-mile journey. Now, Moab is a place that was strictly forbidden by God for his people to live there. Now, I want you to walk with me because this is so important. You may say, well, what's wrong with Moab? Well, the Moabites were a descendant of a man named Moab. Now, if you don't know who Moab is, you can read about him in Genesis chapter 19. How many of you remember when God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah? Do you remember that? So Lot, remember Lot's wife looked back and Lot and his two daughters ran for their lives. Now the two daughters didn't think there were any men left on the earth. So they got their father drunk and went in and slept with their own father. Each girl became pregnant, and one of them birthed a son named Moab. So the Moabites were conceived out of incest, and that was only the beginning of their problems. The Moabites worshipped a false god named Chemosh. And they, this is horrible to even think about or say, but the, the Moabites would actually sacrifice their children to this god Chemosh. This Moabite land was so despised by God from the, its inception till this day, he actually forbade his people to ever live in Moab. Somehow, 
Elimelech thinks it's better in Moab than it is in Judah. Let me tell you, everybody, be, it's always better with God, no matter how hard it is, than away from God. And so they go to this country named Moab, and, and let me tell you what God thinks of Moab. It's recorded in Psalm chapter 60, verse 8. God says, Moab is my wash basin. That's what God thought of Moab. So Elimelech takes his family from Moab, Bethlehem to Moab, a place where they were absolutely forbidden to go. Instead of trusting God where he was at, walk with me, because sometimes times get hard. They were hard for Elimelech and his family. And instead of trusting God where he was at, he went to Moab, as it says in the Judges. Everybody did what was right in their own eyes. I don't want to be too hard on him. Now, there was a famine, famine in the land, and he was probably thinking, if I go to Moab, there'll be a better economy, better job, better life for my family. I get that. But let me issue a gentle spiritual warning here. I've noticed that when it comes to taking care of our families in 37 years of ministry, we're often tempted to prioritize economic provision over spiritual priorities. I said we're often tempted to prioritize economic provision over spiritual priorities for our family. I've seen many times people who were thriving in the church serving in the church, close to God, kids involved. They leave and go somewhere because there's a promotion and there's more money there. And when they get there, they have more money and less God. I, I've had people say to me so many times, Pastor, we're, we're, we're moving, maybe Florida, maybe Phoenix, and, and uh, everything's working out. See, I got this job, I got this promotion, and uh, there's more money, and we've got a good school for the kids, and we've already bought a house, and oh, by the way, do you know if there's any good churches in the area? And I wish I could count the times people have contacted me and said, Pastor, I wish I never would have moved. I'm not saying that's always the wrong thing to do. Uh, sometimes it is the blessing of God, and sometimes it's not. So here we are. Things got tough in Bethlehem. So Limelech leaves for a better economy and a better job and more money. Things got tough in Bethlehem. So he takes his family to this ungodly nation of Moab. I'm coming up your street in just a minute. That's not an earthquake, is it? All right. Remember, Elimelech means my God is king. But he wasn't living like God was his king. His name meant my God is king, but he wasn't living like God was his king. He abandoned Bethlehem, Judah. He went to a God-forsaken country of Moab. What do you do when times get tough? Do you continue to trust God and obey? Or do you move to Moab? Hmm. When I say Moab, I'm talking about what this ungodly world has to offer. Many Christians would say, my God is the king of my life. When times get tough, we move to Moab. For example, maybe you're dating and you know God's word says that sex is to be reserved for the covenant of marriage. You say, I've been dating, and I've been waiting, and I've got this deep desire for mating. <laughs> so what do you do? Do you trust and obey God where you're at, or do you move to Moab? Listen, don't settle for anybody who has no interest in the king of kings. We say, my God is the king of my life, and I'm going to honor him with the tithe, that first tenth of all that he blesses me with, because I know that the tithe belongs to the Lord. And then times get tough. Finances get tight. What do you do? Trust and obey God or move to Moab? You may say, God is the king of my life. I'm going to stop looking at porn. I'm not going to get drunk. I'm not going to smoke weed anymore. And then you have a bad day. You're really stressed out. Do you trust God and obey, or do you move to Moab? I'll shoot straight with you. It's true for me, too. When times get tough, Moab looks tempting. The shiny objects of this world can appear more attractive than the pearl of great price. I want to tell you this. There is nothing 
that this world has to offer that can compare to the living Christ. Amen. I'm glad you said amen that, like that. I was beginning to think none of you ever moved to Moab. We say God is the king of our life, but sometimes we do what we think is right in our own eyes. So what happened? They left Bethlehem. They went to Moab. And everything worked out for a while. They trusted their heart. They lived their own truth. And everything worked out until it stopped working out. Verse 3, Ruth 1. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. She was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. Enter the main character. After they had lived there about 10 years, both Malon and Kilion also died. Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. Naomi's husband died. We don't know what happened. If he had a stroke, he got hit by a camel. We just don't know what happened. She was left with her two sons. Now Elimelech is dead. And I'm somewhat puzzled with her husband dead, why she didn't make the trip back to Judah, to her hometown. Remember how far it was? Anybody remember how far? Yeah, 50 miles. That's all. Oh, you listen good. I mean, that's only two-day walk. Maybe three if you stop at Waffle House and spend the night at Motel 6. Maybe three days. She stays in Moab. That's another mistake. In the beginning of the message, I said there were a lot of bad decisions made here. Elimelech should have never taken his family and left Judah and went to this godless land of Moab. But he did. Elimelech dies and Naomi could go on back home, but she doesn't. And then her two sons make some bad mistakes and they marry Moabite women. Not only did God hate Moab, now the boys married Moabite women. Orpah and Ruth. God strictly forbade them to not marry outside the covenant of Israel. Over the years, I've had a lot of people ask me, Pastor Ross, is it okay since I'm a Christian if I marry someone who's not a Christian? Well, let me tell you what the Bible says. My opinion doesn't really matter. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, it says this, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. I know that limits your playing field. But what's God doing? Is he trying to spoil your fun? No, he's actually loving you. He's actually loving you. Let me ask you this. If Christ is the king of your life, why would you want to spend the rest of your life with someone who Christ is not king? And let, let me tell you, let, let, let me tell you, someday your kid's going to get sick and you're going to need your husband to anoint with oil and lay hands on and pray for the sick, but he's AWOL. You say, well, he's cute. Well, cute ain't going to cut it. Bible says, don't be unequally yoked together. I don't care how cute they are. Does he even have a job? <laughs> yeah, that day. First, Christ is king and he has a job. Okay, that, that'll help. Why would anyone, male or female, want to marry somebody if Christ is king of your life and Christ is not king in their life? Now, they all lived there for about 10 years. Then both sons died. So both sick and tired died too. Elimelech's dead, now sick and tired of dead. And I thought about this. They went to Moab. They left Bethlehem and went to Moab to live. And now they're all dead. Moab never produces what it promises. Moab never produces what it promises. They did what was right in their own eyes, and now we got three widows. Naomi's a widow, and her two daughter-in-laws, Orpah and Ruth, are widows. No husbands, no home, no money. And finally, Naomi decides to return to Bethlehem. Why is it that we wait till we hit rock bottom before we decide to come back home? You can read about this in chapter one. Naomi tells her daughter-in-laws, she tells Orpah and Ruth, she says, she says, go back home. In other words, I'm going back to Judah. You go back home and you marry your own people and you have sons. And she says, she tells her, don't, don't wait for me to have 
more children. What will you do? If I even did have more children, would you wait till they became old? She says, go back home and marry your own people and have babies. So Orpah goes back home and she starts this TV show and she becomes rich and famous. I'm sorry, I just had to throw that in there. And Ruth decides to stay. Ruth is the main character in the story. This is all sets the whole thing up. And she speaks for the first time in Ruth chapter one, verse 16. Here's what it says. In fact, it's the most famous verse in all of the book of Ruth. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. She declares this fierce loyalty to her mother-in-law, but really the most important part of this verse is not her loyalty to a person, but her loyalty to the living God. She says, your people will be my people and your God will be my God. This right here is Ruth's salvation moment. Ruth and Naomi turn and leave this ungodly nation of Moab and they return to Bethlehem. Does anybody know what Bethlehem means? House of bread. Bethlehem, not Moab, was their source. Jesus is the bread of life. Somebody say amen to that. Jesus is the bread. He is the one who will sustain you. I don't care how dark, difficult days you might go through. Never abandon the house of bread for what this world has to offer. He is your sustainer, your provider, your healer, your savior, the one who will keep you in every one of life's troubles. And they finally decide to go back home. I, I love what 1 Corinthians 10, 11 says. It, it's, it's not on the big screen. It says, now all these things, speaking about the Old Testament, they happened as examples to us and were written down as warnings to us. What's the warning here? If you're in Moab or any part of your life is, turn and leave Moab and come back to the house of bread. This is a picture of what the Bible calls in the New Testament repentance. Repentance means to turn. And in order to get where you got to go, it's time to turn. It means to turn from where you are and move to where God wants you to be. Are we together in the house today? And in order, let's say this is Moab, and let's say over there is Bethlehem. In order to get to Bethlehem, you've got to turn your back to Moab. You've got to make it. Ruth, Naomi made a decision to turn. Naomi's decision was a decision to go back home. Ruth's decision was a first time decision. I'm going to go and serve the living God. And this highlights one of the most important truths in the message. To get to the right place, you have to leave the wrong one. I said to get to the right place, you have to leave the wrong one. What's amazing to me, everybody, is that Ruth made one decision to turn her back on the ungodly nation of Moab and go toward the God of Bethlehem. This one decision, don't miss this, this one decision, this one choice changed her life and her legacy. I'll be as bold to say this, this one decision Ruth made, it changed the whole course of the world. I don't want to give away the biggest part of the book in chapter one, but you have to know this. Ruth, the sinful Moabite woman, is drawn into the lineage of Jesus Christ. Because Ruth would become the great grandmother of King David. That God took a woman out of this ungodly cesspool of a nation, and he draws her into the lineage of Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing, everybody? There's nobody, 
There's, there's nobody on the planet that can say, my life is too messed up. My life is too far gone. I'm too broken. I've been messed up. I'm tore up from the floor up. Uh, my life has been an absolute cesspool. I've, I've slept with more people than I can count. I've done drugs and, and I've been in jail and my life has been, how in the world could God use me? I'm just here today to tell you that God specializes in picking people up out of the pit, out of the miry clay and lifting them up, putting them on the solid rock and changing their life, changing their heart, changing their mind, changing the course of their whole life. Who would ever have thought that God would use somebody from the wash basin, from the wash basin where God washed his dirty feet. Whoever would have thought that God would have picked up somebody like that. I'm just here today to tell you, there's a whole bunch of mistakes that were made in this book, but God redeems our bad decisions. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. One decision, Ruth's one decision. Through her one decision, the living water was born. The bread of life was born. The good shepherd was born. The prince of peace was born. The king of kings and the lord of lords came through a sinful Moabite woman. Somebody ought to give God a crazy praise. Praise, praise God, praise God. Amen, how amazing is our God. How amazing is our God. They had to come to a point where they had to walk away. I know that when times get tough, Moab can look tempting with all of its shiny objects, all of its glitter, all of its passion, all that it promises, but Moab never. I said, Moab, this world never produces what it promises. Amen to that. They left Bethlehem to go to Moab, Pastor Matt, so they would live. And they died. Amen. So whatever, and there's this tug of war, I understand. There's Moab and there's Bethlehem. And the devil's always whispering here, come over to my side. It's more fun over here. Come over, come over, and, and you feel the Holy Spirit. Some of you are feeling it right now. There, there's some things in your life that you, I know you've made the decision to follow Jesus, but some things in your life you still left in Moab. And God's saying it's time to, turn, it's time to repent. It's time to turn from Moab. As one prophet said, remember, uh, I, I'm drawing a little blank here, but just came to mind when they went out, I think it was Elijah or Elisha, and they were making stew. And uh, somebody picked some wild gourds and uh, put them in the stew. And when the prophet tasted it, he says, there's death in the pot. Everything the devil offers you, there's death in that pot. And there's this tug of war, come over to my side. And the Holy Spirit is saying, come over to the house of bread. I'm not promising you a life of ease. I'm not promising you that you won't have any troubles or trials or tribulation, but there's always bread in my house, says the Lord. I know that when things get tough, Moab can look tempting, but I'm just here today to tell you that if you're here today, to get to the right place, you have to leave the wrong one. There were some many, many mistakes made here in the first chapter of Ruth, and as Ruth is the main character, she'll become more prominent over the next couple of weeks here. But when I recount and recap the bad decisions, I, Elimelech should never have left Bethlehem to go to Moab. He prioritized economics over spirituality. Naomi should have never stayed. It was only a 50 mile journey. She never should have stayed because if she wouldn't have stayed her sons would not have married Moabite women. So it looks like a mistake. I said it looks like a mistake that she stayed and her boys married Oprah, I mean, Orpah and Ruth. But even though her boy married Ruth, God turned that mess into a miracle. God turned that 
bad mistake and he redeemed it for his glory. I want you to know that God can take a mess. I said God can take your mess and turn it all around. I, I, I shared before, but I'm just popped into my mind. I, when I was 19 years old, I decided to become rich and famous and become the next great radio announcer on the planet. The next Howard Stern, Don Imus, you name them. And I went to West Virginia. I, went to, I, went to, I actually went to broadcasting school instead of Bible school. I, I've never been to theological cemetery. I mean, no, I, 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 I'm just joking. It's, and so I, I, I got into radio broadcasting. I did that for a couple of years. And, and after that didn't really work out for me, uh, I, I went to uh, work at McDonald's. And I was an assistant manager at McDonald's. And I was there when the chicken nuggets came out. Can I get an amen in the house? None like a chicken nugget with some sweet and sour sauce and a big orange drink. And after that didn't work out for a while. See, it worked out for a while until it stopped working out. Going to Moab worked out until it stopped working out. And radio worked well until it stopped working out. And being a manager at McDonald's worked well until it stopped working out. Then I sold accident insurance door to door. There's a career for you. And that worked out until it stopped working out. And God was pulling on my heart all along. I said, God was pulling on my heart all along. I will never forget being in Logan, West Virginia, where it's where I met Luann. Um, that's where that earth-moving kiss happened. In West Virginia in 1979. I felt the earth move under my feet. I felt the sky tumble in. <laughs> I just lost anointing for 30 seconds right there. I'll never forget, I remember where I was on one of those streets and I remember the store I was driving by where I heard God. One and only time, call my name. And I stopped the car and I turned to the back seat because I thought somebody was there. And it wasn't until years later that I realized God was calling me. 1984, I was working in a sheet metal factory upstate New York and God began to get a hold of my life again. I raised in the church, raised in the church, raised in a Christian home, baptized 10 years old in a muddy creek and filled with the Holy Spirit at 12 years old and served the Lord. But when I hit 19, I went to Moab. Well, I was on radio broadcasting this dude from New York. I, I lived with him and I'd never smoked pot in my life and he had a bong. I mean, this dude didn't play. It wasn't just a, a, a joint. He had a bong and he taught me how to use that. I was, in a, I was in Bethlehem and I thought Moab looked better so I went to Moab and rock and roll and business and 1984 I hit the bottom and moved back home and I was making minimum wage at a sheet metal factory. But God was moving on my heart and he reminded me, me that he had called me in 1979. And I started doing my, this is before the internet, Al Gore hadn't invented it yet. And uh, I did all my courses at my kitchen table, and God put me in the ministry. Whenever people talk about what Bible school they went to, I always embarrassed because I never went to Bible school. And I really thought my life was a failure. And then God showed me something, that he, I, I should have went to Bible school at 19, but I didn't. And God showed me something. My life wasn't a failure. Because in radio, he taught me to communicate. And when I was managing McDonald's, he taught me to administrate. And when I got in sales, he taught me how to really present. And God spoke to me one day and it took the guilt off my shoulders of feeling like I was a failure. And every step I took that I thought was a mistake, God redeemed for his glory. Amen. So you may think you've messed up Royal. David, you and team can come. I'm, you may think you've messed up Royal. Um, I want you to know that God loves you. 
And God can take what you think is a total mess and turn it into something for his glory. Elimelech did what was right in his own eyes. Naomi, Malan, and uh, the other dude, whatever his name was, I think it was Tired, his name was Tired. They all did what was right in their own eyes. What does that mean to you today? I want you to know that God is working. David, you sang it earlier. Even though we can't see it, he's working. God was working in 1979 when I couldn't see it. 1980, 1981, God was, even though you don't see it, he's working. Even though you can't feel it, he's working. The fact that you're here today says that God is working in your life. And he brought you here just to get you to sit still long enough so that you could realize that even though you maybe made some bad decisions, God can redeem your mistakes. You know, I love that verse, Romans 8, 28. I think you know it as well as I do. Say it with me. For all things work together for good. Say it with me. All things. How many things? All, how many things? All things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. All things isn't all the good things. Sometimes it's the bad decisions, and sometimes it's the mistakes that God can turn it around for his good. But I believe today that as we get ready to prepare our hearts for communion, God's calling us away from Moab. You say, well, Pastor, you don't understand. See, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christ follower. I, I get that. I get that. But we may have some parts of our life left in Moab. You say, God is king of my life, but maybe you're really doing what's right in your own eyes. And I never want to preach a message without a so what at the end. So what? So let me put this up on the big screen. What one decision could you make today that would change the trajectory of your life? What one decision could you make today that would change the trajectory of your life? If you need some help, my job is to help you. The greatest decision you will ever make, and you may be here today, and you have not yet made the decision to be a Christ follower. The greatest decision you could make would be to repent, which means to turn. Turn from this life of emptiness and come toward the house of bread or the bread of life. The greatest decision you will ever make is to bow your knee and surrender your life to Jesus. Ruth did it for the first time. Naomi was really coming back home to the house of bread. Let me get a little more practical. Some of you could, if there's some part in Moab, maybe you're bitter. Some of you may, maybe could be the first to apologize. I'm sorry for my part in what happened. Some of you may need to break up with him and move out. If you're not married, some of you could confess your addiction and ask for help. Others could surrender something to God. What is that, Russ? whatever it is that's holding you back from being a fully committed follower of Jesus. Let me say it again. To get to the right place, you have to leave the wrong place. When I look at Ruth and see, and see in, in her story, we find God in ordinary people. They're not big TV evangelists. They don't haven't written any books. They've never graced the stage. They're ordinary people. And this sermon series is about finding God in the ordinary. Ordinary people and in the ordinary days of our life. Not the devil. God is in the details. And Ruth made a life-changing, world-changing decision. It changed her life and it changed all the whole course of the world. Because why? Because she became one that was brought into the lineage of Jesus. Would you bow your heads with me, please?